Beloved brothers and sisters, for 40 of the last 50 years we have been celebrating the Feast of Pascha, honoring him who conquered death by death and bestowed life to the entire race of humans who were in the tombs of death and despair. Today, on the 50th day since that celebration, we honor the Holy Spirit, who has conquered fear in our hearts and has given life to the world through the foundation of the Holy Church of God. This the Holy Spirit has done by transforming the band of Jesus' disciples and apostles gathered together on a specific day in Jerusalem into the body of Christ. The extension in time and space, the continuation in human history and culture of the one through all things were made. This Pentecost, we celebrate not so much an event of history as the ongoing manifestation of the life-giving power of God, the Holy Spirit, who transforms what had been into what is, and what is into what it can become. In the week just concluded, a significant event has been going on at St. Helena Parish in Cleveland. A number of distinguished professors, academics, researchers, and others have gathered for the first International Epaminondo Lukács Symposium. Papers presented during the symposium were of various historical and related topics, and several new books were launched by the Petrostinia in Helena who was responsible for convening the symposium, launched his new book, Historia di Sergi Greco Catholici Romane, in Stato de Comunità Italia Medici, o mia nova sulla tre, o mia nova sulla tre, o mia nova sulla tre. The History of the Romanian Greek Catholic Church in the United States, 1906-2016. This book, which is a development of Father Stinia's doctoral dissertation, is the only history of our Romanian Catholic Church in the U.S. ever written. Although I was not able to be present for all the papers, several of them had to do with the contributions of the priests who have served our parishes in the U.S., who have suffered for our church in Romania before coming to the U.S., including Father Epaminonda Lukac, whose granddaughter was here, Father Mircea Todorich, Father Alexander Grazzi, from a senior college conference. So I've spent a considerable amount of time in the past days learning something about and reflecting on the past. What follows in this homily is something of a continuation of that process. And those of you who know me uh, know that this is not the way I usually preach. I prefer to be much more spontaneous, uh, much more open to the spirit as I go. And I like to interact with you a little bit and may perhaps make a homily more of a joint production a little bit. But so you know when I sit down like this, with a stack of papers in my hands. Well, first of all, we're all in trouble. <laughs> oh, you, you know, I'm about to do something either unusually serious or unusually foolish, if not both. I think that the last time I did this, I was presenting the letter I had written for Great Gun just before the opening shots of the war without end in Iraq in 2003. After reading that letter, my grandmother, Lil, Nasa, Godmother, Nidlo, Nasha, came up to me to venerate the cross as usual and remark how cold my hands were. Indeed they were. Because I did not know what the consequences of putting out that a statement condemning the war my country was about to begin would be for me or for my church. Well, a little poetic license here. My hands are cold today, too, once again. Although this holiday is nothing like that letter, the state of our country and the world is none the better for all the violence and carnage inflicted upon it in the last 13 years. It turns out that that war set into motion circumstances and chains of events that have made the region far less stable than they were 13 years ago. Things don't always turn out the way we plan. But today is not my intention to reflect on the passage of those 13 years, however as significant as they may have been as full of slaughter as they have been. Rather, it is my intention to reflect back a bit on my own life and ministry, upon what I've done, what is, and maybe what it can become. As you know, this Pentecost, I am celebrating 30 years as a priest. And the diocese is using this occasion also to mark the 20 years of ministry as bishop I will complete in August. Furthermore, we are ordaining soon to be Father Andrea Roshka, the Holy Priest. In the context of these events, past and present, 
There's a great deal I've been reflecting on, and it made sense to me to share some of these reflections with you through this homily, which has, for some strange reason, not only to have been extraordinarily difficult for me to write. We humans are building animals. We like to believe that we are accomplishing something. And in moments of reflection, we tend to turn back and see what, if anything, we actually have built, what we've produced with our hands and with our use of freedom and our time. So it seems appropriate and necessary to look back on 20 or 30 years and see what, if anything, was built. But this is a dangerous and deceptive enterprise. Not that the church and her ministers should not have goals, and not that everyone needs to step back every once in a while to measure progress, or the lack of it, from time to time. Rather, the dangerous and deceptive part of this tendency to measure oneself and to pass judgment, positive or negative, on oneself. This is a spiritual error of the first order, since who we are is much more important than what we do. <coughs> Even so, what we do is inevitably a reflection of and an outgrowth of who we have chosen to be, and at the same time, what we choose to do has an indelible impact on what we will become. Thirty years is plenty of time to see dreams fade and hopes dashed to bits. Some of the faded dreams involve parishes that found their continued existence unsustainable. Like it or not, at their own request, I closed the parishes of St. John, Heritage, Pennsylvania, St. Basil in Lorraine, Ohio. St. Theodore in Alliance also asked to be closed, but I have kept it open in the hope that eventually a Catholic worker community will form there to carry out the works of mercy of the spirit of Catholic personalist philosophy. Uh, the philosophy of Peter Moore and Dorothy Day, but which would also live out of the spirituality of the Byzantine East. I even had the thought that such a place would be ideal for me for my retirement. To live out my remaining days in peace and repentance, trying to do some good for someone. Crazy one. That dream has yet to come to fruition, since what had been started at St. Theodore has moved off in a different direction for the time being. We will see what the future will bring there. At the same time, several of our parishes are either unable to sustain the expenses of maintaining the building or the priest. Others have virtually no members left. And the future of these institutions must be given some critical consideration. These are among the challenges that we face. Then there's the personal side of things. Thirty years is plenty of time to make lots of mistakes and to accumulate not a few regrets. Age and experience have indeed taught me a thing or two over the years. I realize that I've not done everything well, that I've made mistakes, and that even the things I have had to do that have been unpopular with some, I could have done with greater finesse, and more kindness and concern. <coughs> there are relationships that have soured badly over the years, for instance, with some members of our. I deeply regret that. I miss those people, those people involved, even if they do not and do not always agree. And one of the things I feel particularly uncomfortable with is the realization that, despite my good intentions, I have weakened the appropriate voice of the laity in our church by not taking care of that diocesan assemblies or congresses or conventions or whatever you want to call them were held frequently enough. This may simply have been a matter of my personal perfectionism, which a vice, not a virtue. Perhaps in this case, I allowed my own ideas of what was good to override what was good enough. I hope there is time to repair some of that damage. And in connection with that, I have not been able to provide a follow-up to the events, discussions, and times we have had. The capacity simply has not been there. Uh, but in the 30 years I have been a priest, I have learned that there are things I simply have lacked capacity, skill, or energy to do. There are things I have not done and cannot do, and perhaps never will do. In 30 years I have learned that it's not all about me, either. In 30 years as a priest, I have seen God do some pretty amazing things. As a bishop, I haven't been able to be as close to people as I once was, but when I have had a chance to be a part of others' families, to be a witness to their spiritual journeys, I was in awe of seeing the hand of God at work in individual lives. That, in a word, is the joy of the privilege.
privilege to preach. 20 years as a bishop has given me plenty of time to see God at work in his church. Mission communities in New York and Los Angeles established during and even before the creation of our apostolic Pope <coughs> John Paul II, the bishop was discussed as its head, have gone through periods of struggle, but are now seeing better days, thanks be to God. Even though much hard work remains, new communities have sprung up in Oxnard, in Anaheim, California, and Boston, Massachusetts. And St. Peter and Paul Mission in Chicago has experienced such strong growth that it is now in full apparent. <coughs> The Holy See added Canada to the jurisdiction of the Abbey. So communities in Toronto and Montreal are now part of our family. By the strange but wonderful workings of divine providence, we have been able to welcome into our family two monastic communities, Holy Resurrection Monastery in St. Asians, Wisconsin, and Holy Theophany Convent in Olympia, Washington. Abbot Nicholas, whom we all know, is here together with our brother and good friend, the one formerly known as Tomas Murray who has now been tonsured as Brother Sorsha, for all of you who came. And I should tell you that the name Sorsha, which is Irish for George, was chosen for him by his abbot to recognize that Tomas came to them from us, from this eparchy of St. George, this community of St. George, and he received the habit on the Feast of St. George, our patron feast. The presence of these consecrated men and women has been an enormous blessing and source of great spiritual enrichment not only for our own effort, through their contact and fraternal support of Most Holy Trinity Monastery, Comunidad de Monastica Graciente Trey in the Eparchy of Lugos in Romania, we, through our monks, are supporting the renewal of traditional Byzantine monasticism in our church in Romania as well. Consider to the miracle that it, that it is that we have not closed more parishes in the last 20 years, when economics, demographics, and social trends are all set. Consider the miracle that a Romanian Greek Catholic Church, once thought consigned to the dustbin of history by communist malevolence, is now free, though it must now find its own way in a world vastly different from the one it lived in when it was forced into ground. Something that deserves particular mention so that in gratitude we may glorify the great good shepherd of his flock is that our people should know that we have a vocation problem. By that I mean to say that God has granted us an extraordinary group of priests, both from Romania and from the United States. We have not found them. They have found us. Or rather, God has prepared them for the very special work involved in taking care of souls in our church in the West. I don't need to name names. We're looking at many of them. Extraordinary, talented men, one and all, devoted to God's church and to their natural or monastic families, and no less dedicated to the service of God's altar and people. The problem, the vocation problem, is that there has been no lack of vocations where we needed them. What we have lacked is a means of supporting them and their families while they begin their missionary work in order to be able to sustain the many new missions we need. I pray that God, through the generosity of his people, may help us find a solution to this unique kind of vocation crisis. In particular, though, I have to acknowledge that in these last few years, God has also begun to assemble a very talented team of lay and clerical pastoral workers who assist me in a direct way in the governance of the effort by their work here at Canton in the Chancery. Father Vidya Montignan, Father Yuri Montignan, Deacon George Wendt, Jotessa Carmen Sinha, and Fossan, Raul and Sylvia Volta, and Julie Schatzmeyer, all have come forward to apply their unique skills, which turn out to have been a very good fit for our Chancery to the work of providing structure and pastoral support to our pastors and parishes. May God bless and strengthen them in all that we do. Having been named a bishop by Pope St. John Paul II, it has been an enormous privilege for me to have served under three popes thus far. The year prior to my Episcopal ordination saw the publication of Pope John Paul II's apostolic letter, Oriental Lumen. It was this letter that inspired the restoration of the Society of St. John Paul II. <laughs> and the creation of its American section, which went on to establish the Oriental Lumen Conferences and the Oriental Lumen Foundation. One of the privileges for which I have been most grateful as bishop has been that of serving upon the request of Mr. Jack Fiebel, the founder of what his All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople called the Oriental Lumen Movement, as the Catholic co-patron of the Society of St. John Chrysostom, 
In this capacity, I have been able to work alongside the Ukrainian Orthodox Archbishop Sevlov of Skopelos of blessed memory, and more recently alongside Metropolitan Kalisos Weyer of the OTA. In this grassroots effort to promote knowledge of the Christian East and to foster the unity of the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Under Pope Benedict XVI, we have seen our Romanian Greek Catholic Church elevated to the dignity of a major archiepiscopal church whose head, our own Archbishop Luciano, was also promoted to the dignity of a cardinal of the Holy Roman See. Also under Benedict, I was privileged to participate in the first ever visit ad linea apostolorum, to the threshold of the apostles, of all the bishops of the Eastern Catholic Churches in the United States, as one body, to the tombs of St. Peter and Paul, and to the Holy Father himself. These are the things that have been for us, for you as believers, and for me as your bishop, for the past 20 years. And now under the leadership and inspiration of Pope Francis, I believe that we are beginning to see something of what our little flock may become. In the first place, under Pope Francis, the yoke of forced celibacy for our priests has finally been abolished. Although we were served well by a generation of dedicated widowed and celibate priests in the 20th century, mandatory celibacy was a yoke that the church could not sustain, either pastorally or morally. We were finally able to emerge from this dark closet of hypocrisy to the light of day with our ancient, legitimate, and apostolic tradition of a married priesthood intact, even in the United States and Canada. But this is only the beginning. Having survived the tyranny of communism in Romania and the distortions of Latinization in America, we now have the opportunity and the duty to take our full part as mature members of a Catholic Church whose missionary character is emerging undeniable as constitutive of its existence. Pope Francis' apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudi, the joy of the gospel, which has been described as a magna carta of church reform, puts forth a vision of the church's life that is not only applicable to the entire church, including this little flock, but also points to ways in which we can assume a certain kind of leadership at the vanguard of this transformation. There's a portion of this document that we would do well to examine in its entirety. I quote from Anjali Gaudi. I dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything, so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. The renewal of structures demanded by pastoral conversion can only be understood in this light as part of an effort to make them more mission-oriented, to make ordinary pastoral activity on every level more inclusive and open, to inspire in pastoral work with a constant desire to go forth, and in this way to elicit a positive response from all those whom Jesus summons to friendship with himself. As John Paul II once said to the bishops of Oceania, all renewal in the church must have mission as its goal if it is not the fault prey to a kind of ecclesial introversion. Pope Francis immediately goes on. The parish is not an outdated institution. Precisely because it possesses great flexibility, it can assume quite different contours depending on the openness and missionary creativity of the pastor of the community. While certainly not the only institution which evangelizes, if the parish proves capable of self-renewal and constant adaptivity, it continues to be the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. This presumes that it really is in contact with the homes and the lives of its people, and does not become a useless structure out of touch with people or a self-absorbed group made up of the chosen few. The parish is the presence of the church in a given territory, an environment for hearing God's word, for growth in the Christian life, for dialogue, proclamation, charitable outreach, worship, and celebration. In all its activities, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. It is a community of communities, a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the, mid drink in the midst of their journey, a center of constant missionary outreach. We must admit, though, that the call to review and renew our parishes has not yet sufficed to bring them nearer to people, to make them environments of living communion and participation, and to make them Completely mission oriented until the above you prepare us to accept. The challenge Pope Francis proposes to the Church in these few lines is to call to spiritual arms, deafening in its clarity. 
And it is no surprise that exactly that that exactly deafness and even opposition have arisen in those quarters of the church, including in her hierarchy. Her devotion to the status quo provides the very dish definition of what Pope St. John Paul II called the ecclesial introversion. As an aside, in a day in which so-called defenders of the faith have found it necessary to attempt to protect the church from the very rock upon which Christ founded it, to defend the bark of Peter from Peter himself, let it be known beyond any doubt that the message, the leadership, and the example of Pope Francis have found a residence and a home in the effort of St. George, and we will not be disloyal. No less than anywhere else, parishes of the remaining Catholic Eparchy of St. George themselves must become, in the Pope's words, environments of living communion and participation, completely mission-oriented. Making our parishes mission, completely mission-oriented must become the focus, the passion, indeed the obsession of every priest, priest or monk, nun, of every believer in every parish of this diocese. Our existing parishes must see themselves as springboards for new missionary activities. We must use the structures and the communities that we have to generate new life where life is needed, particularly, but not exclusively, among those whose pursuit of a better life for themselves and their families has brought them from Romania to the United States and Canada. While praiseworthy in itself, this desire for advancement, if left to grow wild in lives uncultivated by faith and deep spirituality, can easily become soul destroying. While members themselves do not tell a complete story, neither can they be avoided. Those parishes that have resigned themselves to declining membership, and those pastors who are unwilling to dedicate their pastoral activity to reversing such decline, ought to know, ought to know that not only they, but all of us, will reap the sad results of such faithless stewardship. In today's Gospel, Jesus tells us that streams of living water will flow forth from those who believe in him. And John goes on to explain that he said this in reference to the Spirit that those who came to believe in him were to receive. There is no reason that any of our parishes or any of our parishioners should become stagnant swamps of despair. The Holy Spirit, as we read today in the Acts of the Apostles, has been poured out lavishly on all of us. If we will but recognize that and abandon ourselves and our institutions to the power, the operation, and the liberating presence of the Holy Spirit, which, as Christians, has become our birthright, or rather the consequence of our rebirth, our communities have every possibility to end power, to become fountains of living water, of faith, of life and purpose for anyone, anyone who is thirsty regardless of their language, culture, or DNA. We can no longer afford to leave the mission of evangelization to Roman Catholics who already have their hands full dealing with secularization and other consequences of the hollowed out Western culture. We have got to put our gifts, the specific gifts the Holy Spirit has given to the Romanian Greek Catholic Church, gifts of littleness and simplicity, of warmth and family, of resourcefulness and beauty, to the service of the Lord who provided them and not more than selfishly for ourselves. Today we are being given a great sign of God's care for us, this church. In a few moments, you can attend Roshka. We'll be receiving the grace of the Holy Priesthood by the laying on of my hands and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not just some career move or even the fulfillment of a long and pious dream, although it is that, for Adi and for Adi. And we congratulate him and his family for that. No, it is a sign from God that the body of Christ should go on in us and among us. That the Lord continues to desire to feed his people with his own flesh and blood. And that he has chosen the to be his consecrated instrument for that purpose. Adrian, sorry, I keep saying David. Adrian's brand new priesthood like my 30-year-old priesthood, like the priesthood of all of us who stand with me around the holy table, is a sign to all of us of the love of the bride of Jesus Christ for his church. A sign that the cross still stands, and that streams of living water still flow, together with his life-giving blood from the pierced side of the Lamb of God who was slain for the life of the world. 
there's an understanding that these circumstances now you can sort of say, oh, no, this is an aside. There was one, one obituary I published in the media. And because of the prohibition against Mary Teresa in the West, I almost, almost edited out references to the priest's family. The people that lived with his whole life, who gave him meaning and purpose. But thanks to God, I got over that. And we put all of that in. And so it is a sign of great joy that the very first pastoral act that simply Father Ali contemplates is baptizing his new daughter, Andrea, who's over there underneath that white paper we have in front of us. She's been waiting for her dad to be backed up, for so she can be backed up, to receive the living one. But I would not leave, leave this leave, um, excuse me, I would not have you leave this assembly. And it is true, the service will sooner or later come to an end. Without one final consideration. In and through all that has been said in this holiday, all that has been done or will be done in this liturgy, all that I have experienced in 30 years of priesthood, 20 years of episcopacy, and almost 61 years on this planet, there is but one reality that motivates, creates, and sustains everything. That reality is God, whom Jesus reveals as our Father, the God of unconditional love and everlasting mercy, who calls us to life with Him, and therefore to a life of holy love, a love that reflects the nonviolent, active love of friend and enemy commanded of us by our Master. On Pentecost in 1986, surrounded by family, friends, believers who were on the diocese, and above all, by the overpowering love of the Holy One, I was ordained a priest, just as I think I was being ordained today. I was inspired to share a little thought by the 11th century St. Simeon, the new theologian, on the memorial card I distributed to my guests as a gift to them. It is a reminder of the reality of the holy things we are about today. That they are not just pious fantasies, but living truths we can experience, which can liberate and enlighten us. Let me conclude with the same gift to you from St. Simeon, the new theologian. O holy love, the one who knows you not has never tasted the sweetness of your mercies, which only living experience can give us. But the one who has known you, or has been known by you, can never again have even the smallest doubt. For you are the fulfillment of the law, you who fill burn, and kindle, embrace my heart with the measureless charity. You are the teacher of the prophets, the offspring of the apostles, the strength of the martyrs, the inspiration of fathers and doctors, the perfecting of all the saints. And you, O oh love, prepare even 